A lot is made of why certain nations are so ineffective in the Second World War, such as Italy or France, and most people who care to look into it can understand why they didn't perform so well by now. What isn't as much looked into is what made the German army such a superior force to anything else at the time. Usually the excuse of superior technology is made, but the gulf between Allied technology and German was hardly worlds apart. When making this channel, my main interest isn't tanks, planes, or where each division was at what time, but rather the politics and motivations of each side and of individuals. Making millions of men fight and die for a cause is no easy task, which leads me to the point of my video. I believe the German army was the most effective because they believed in their cause the most and they had the most to lose. This was the last roll of the dice for them and failure wasn't an option. Most nations capitulated when the writing was on the wall. Once the Allies took Sicily, Italy began its process of deposing Mussolini and switching sides. When the Germans got to Paris, a few days later, France gave up. Much is made of the British not giving up, but had the Germans managed to get to the mainland, which they had no realistic way of doing, I doubt Britain would have held on until the bitter end. We are hardly the most warlike of people. This leaves us with two exceptions, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. The Soviet Union was an iron dictatorship and suffered from massive problems with desertion. Millions went into German captivity without much of a fight, and hundreds of thousands, maybe even over a million, fought alongside the Germans, not to mention their SS units made up of former Soviet citizens, in particular Latvians, Estonians and Ukrainians. The Soviet Union is an example of an inwards repression. They could not surrender because Stalin would not let them surrender. If you wavered, the commissars would kill you. In the German case, while Hitler did steadfastly refuse to surrender in the East, this wasn't the case in the West, and he was the one clamouring for peace with them, because he didn't see the point in the war with the Western Allies, there was nothing he wanted from them. This opinion prevailed throughout almost all the German people. They didn't understand why the Allies would poke their nose in their affairs with Poland and continue such a conflict against them. In the East, it was a different story. While peace offers were made indirectly through Ribbentrop and the like, there wasn't ever a mass movement for peace like in the West. This wasn't Hitler forcing his troops forward, this was a war the German people, and their foreign SS units, wanted to, and often volunteered to fight. This was life or death for them, and they were up to take the gamble. There was very few desertions in the German army, and even fewer Germans switched sides. The numbers were negligible. Why then, did the German people fight so hard and not waver? The writing was on the wall as early as 1943, even 1942 if you had good foresight at the time. Why continue such a conflict when your odds of success are so low? What made the German people so loyal to Adolf Hitler? Two things before we begin. Firstly, I'm going to be talking of different peoples and their worldviews. If I explain why the German people loved certain aspects of Adolf Hitler, that does not mean I agree with them. I'm just presenting the facts. An American sees the world differently to an Iraqi. An Israeli sees it differently to a Palestinian. A Serb sees it differently to an Albanian. A Hungarian to a Romanian. Please do not assume I agree with certain things I say if I'm speaking of how a certain group thinks. Secondly, I appreciate the continued and growing support, and a special thanks goes out to my donators on Patreon, Lobster to You, Darway Lololol, and Sigmar. Their support allows me to make these videos and soon be able to make them full time. Anything helps, even the $2 tier on Patreon. So if you love these videos and you have a spare few dollars a month flying around, please consider donating. My Telegram channel is also down below, which is pretty lively. Thank you. In Mein Kampf, Hitler uses the word Weltanschauung, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, uh, yeah, repeatedly. This is the German word for a philosophy and worldview held by an individual or a collective people. Let's talk about the German people's Weltanschauung. In the minds of the German people, they had been dealt a ridiculously harsh hand at Versailles. The interwar years had given way to a time that none of them wished to revisit. Weimar Germany, to most, was a cultural cesspool and the economic life of the people was a disaster. The Wall Street crash, as well as the currency being all over the place in general due to the huge war repayments their nation had to make, led to a miserable time for the people. People often ask, how could the German people follow such a monster like Hitler? But to them, he was their only hope. One man rose up from the depressing interwar period to offer them that hope. There was no alternative. He made hefty promises to the German people and kept them. He had fixed the economy and given the unemployed jobs. He enforced strict workplace rules to stop the oppressive bosses. He had built the autobahn to connect the nation. The cultural decay in most Germans' eyes vanished in a flash. The degeneracy they loathed so much was a thing of the past. Much can be said of Adolf Hitler, but to the German people, he was their saviour, and this wasn't all bluster. If you were Jewish, your life just got much more difficult and many found a way out. But if you were ethnically German, you were living in the greatest times in living memory. We are very quick to judge other people in this scenario, but have we not done the exact same thing? When something benefits us, we conveniently forget the horrors that go along with it. Behind the meat industry is warehouses full of industrialised slaughter and cramped, horrible conditions. If most saw it, they wouldn't eat meat. For the iPhone you potentially are using right now to watch this video, some Chinese kid was working 12 hours a day for slave wages to put it together. 
You get my point. Most Germans benefited greatly and lived a better life under Hitler than before. To the minority, it was the inverse, obviously. When I speak of Germans in this video, I mean your typical ethnic German, so no what ifs in the comments please. When it came to war, the people had his back. In their mind, this was the one chance they had to throw off the shackles of Versailles. They accepted their fate together. They didn't want to fight the Western Allies, but the Western Allies would not make peace, essentially a white peace which Hitler was offering, so fight on, they must. If they were to lose this war, it would be like a prisoner committing a crime while on parole. They would get the book thrown at them. They had no choice but to succeed and take the gamble. The Germans knew that if they lost this war, then things would never be the same for them again and Germany would change forever, which it did. The choice was binary. They had to fight until the end. The Italians could be rid of Mussolini and life would continue, albeit a little differently. The French could be France again when the war ended. Their everyday lives would not change that much from before the war if the British made peace and the German occupation ended. The Americans lived an entire continent away with no fear of ever being invaded or even attacked. The Germans did not have this luxury. If they lost, it was all over and their world would vanish for something new to arise. In early 1943, when the Allies made the Casablanca Declaration announcing that there would be no negotiations with Germany, Italy and Japan, and that only unconditional surrender would be acceptable to them, the effect was immediate. Much like the Morgenthau plan later on, this was almost entirely Roosevelt's idea that he pushed for. He wanted to assure Stalin, who he was head over heels for at this point, that there would be no separate peace, which was worrying Stalin. Stalin himself thought this declaration ridiculous. Even up until the Battle of Kursk, and less enthusiastically later, he would discuss peace terms for intermediaries with the Germans himself. Churchill, usually the arch warmonger in Europe who just wanted to get in there and have a fight, did not have his heart in it either. But Britain was effectively a vassal state of the USA at this point, and he had no choice but to go along with whatever Roosevelt said. Roosevelt explained in a radio address that by unconditional surrender he meant, We mean no harm to the common people of the Axis nations, but we do mean to impose punishment and retribution upon their guilty, barbaric leaders. The German people were not stupid. They had heard this talk before. In the First World War, they reluctantly accepted defeat on the basis of President Wilson's 14 points, which were not honoured. The German people had suffered massively after that war ended, thousands starving to death during the British blockade which never let up even after the armistice so they could push for harsher and harsher terms. They were not going to fall for the same trick again. The reality was that the German people would suffer just as much as their leaders. In fact, in the first war, it was just the people who had suffered. The Kaiser lived a comfy exile in the Netherlands instead. To the German people, the message was loud and clear. This was going to be a fight to the death, no matter how many encouraging words Roosevelt spewed about the announcement. If there was no negotiated peace, they were going to suffer and die, and those that survived would see their country splintered. To many, the chance of death was preferable to seeing their nation in the state that it was during the Weimar Republic period again. From the 12th to the 16th of September 1944, Franklin Roosevelt and Henry Morgenthau Jr., the Secretary of the US Treasury, spent four days pressuring a reluctant Winston Churchill into accepting their plan for post-war Germany at the Second Quebec Conference. To get him to accept, Morgenthau threatened to cut off all post-war aid to Britain. In modern day money, this totaled $666 billion. I've made an entire video covering the plan in detail, but to summarize, it would strip Germany of all her industry, condemning millions of Germans to starvation, relocation, and death. The industry would be given to the countries that had suffered from German invasion. Due to the other man who had a hand in drafting the plan, Harry Dexter White, being a Soviet spy, it is assumed this meant mostly the Soviet Union. Tens of thousands of German officers were to be shot without trial. The nation itself would cease to exist. Instead of the two parts it was split into anyway, it would instead be split into several different smaller nations, as well as a gigantic international zone, where Germany would effectively be raped of all the resources by the Allies and Soviets. The excess population was to be dumped in the deserts of North Africa. Churchill was heavily against this, but was backed into a corner with the threat of the aid being taken away, so he accepted. One who could not be pushed around though was Henry Stimson from the State Department. On the basis of this plan being against Christian values, he leaked the plan to the press, it was published worldwide and Roosevelt was thrown into a crisis where he had to claim ignorance of the plan, despite his signature literally being on the paper. When the news arrived in Germany of the plan, the reaction isn't hard to imagine. Nazi propaganda for years had spoken of, in their words, Judeo-Bolshevism and Jewish capitalism, seeking to destroy the German people and the German nation, be it morally, culturally, financially or literally. The Allies had played right into German hands. The US Army was furious, lambasting Morgenthau for making the Germans fight harder when they were trying to convince the German troops to do the opposite and surrender. Morgenthau didn't care. He was out for blood. The German people were ready to fight harder than any other army anyway, but this new information gave them a new lease of life. 
Reports flooded back informing the leading allies about this and what a mess they'd made. The German people now knew that if they surrendered, their nation would quite literally cease to exist. There would be no home to go back to. Roosevelt had done Hitler's job for him. As a result of their previous experiences with the First World War, their appreciation and love for Hitler for turning the country around before the war, and the American blunders of unconditional surrender, and the Morgenfeld plan, the German armed forces became loyal to the end. The Americans at the Battle of the Bulge were shocked by the Germans' sheer determination, willpower, and fanaticism to fight to the end, even though the end result seemed clear that Germany was doomed. They knew total destruction awaited them if they did not fight. All of these were statements that were factual to some degree. Hitler had indeed turned Germany around, he did have the loyalty of the German people. The First World War peace treaty was a betrayal, and the American announcements regarding post-war Germany were extreme and in German eyes unfair. There was one other reason that many Germans, especially higher ranking Germans with doubts about the logic of fighting to the bitter end, expressed which, which were more fantastical than reality. This was Hitler's super weapons. For years he had been talking of super weapons that would turn the tide of the war. When a general would come to him, he would fob them off by saying that the tide would soon turn because of the development of his super weapons that were almost finished. He even used this on Benito Mussolini around the time that he was deposed, and also when he rescued him. Mussolini would sometimes buy it, sometimes he wouldn't. The generals rarely bought it. Rommel dismissed it as nonsense, and his relationship with Hitler soured as a result. The V1 and V2 rockets in reality were, in fact, very underwhelming compared to what had been promised. Regardless, beforehand and even afterwards, many generals or men in the armed forces of higher rank or other foreign leaders had faith in Hitler's weapons and fought on to the bitter end. The final question that should be asked is probably that in the end, was it worth it? I'm not qualified to answer the question. I'm not German. That question is for the German people alone. Germany was in the end split in half, one half being essentially a Soviet vassal state and the other an American one. Whilst it was eventually unified, was it ever sovereign? The definition of an occupied nation is a nation being occupied by foreign troops. Germany is, to this day, an occupied nation. As of February 2022, there is an estimated 35,000 US troops in Germany. Whether this is a good or bad thing, I leave up to the viewer. Again, whether it was worth carrying on fighting is for the German people. I am simply representing the facts of why they did so. However you personally would like to interpret that information is up to you.